Good afternoon, everyone. Before we get started, I have to say thanks to all of you. This is my first trip to Africa. It is my first trip to Rwanda. I had no idea what to expect. And I have found such enthusiasm and such brilliance and such an amazing ability to share and think outside the box that every time I turn around, I have been blown away. So thank you very, very much. And some of that has actually informed the talk that I wrote before I got on the plane to come here because some of it is relevant. So let's start in India. There's a firm in India called Marico. They make beauty products. In order to make these beauty products, they need a steady supply of coconuts. And they had a whole group of middlemen that they used to buy their coconuts from. And the middlemen actually weren't all that reliable, the prices weren't reliable, the supplies weren't reliable. So in 2012, Marico decided they were going to try something different. There are tens of thousands of coconut pickers in India, and they asked all those coconut pickers to text them their numbers. And then, what would happen is every morning, Marico would send out a text message to those pickers with the daily price they were going to pay for the coconuts. And the coconut picker could make a decision about whether they were going to sell their coconuts to Marico or sell them on the open market. And all of a sudden, Marico now had a steady supply of coconuts, and by small fluctuations in the price, could modulate the number of coconuts that they were getting delivered. And this is, of course, almost an Adam Smith definition of what I call coconut capitalism. Now, it worked because all of those coconut pickers had mobiles. There's nothing unusual about that because as of last month, as of January 2015, half of the human race owned a mobile. And so, now, wherever you are in the world, the market travels with the mobile. So wherever you get a mobile signal, there's a marketplace there. It connects people without place or time being an issue. The mobile and the market have emerged as two sides of the same coin. And of course, East Africa knows this better than any place else on the planet. The explosive growth of M-Pesa fused the mobile and the market through flows of capital. And it's a truly astonishing amount of Kenya's payments flows through GDP, uh, flows through M-Pesa. We heard this yesterday. I was scattering around for figures, but apparently 60% of Kenya's GDP passes through M-Pesa as a float, which is just, it's incredible. And what is it? That's people making payments to individuals or to small businesses, small businesses paying one another. That's one layer, mobile payments. But now we're starting to see companies that are building upon mobile payments to start to go to mobile capital. And there's a startup in America called Stellar. They've launched a new digital currency that facilitates transactions in local currencies in developing countries. And they announced a partnership last week with a South African company or messaging platform known as, known as Vumi. Now, Vumi is used in South Africa to deliver messages to expectant mothers to keep them healthy. So it, it monitors them and delivers them advice over the course of their pregnancy, which means Vumi already has this connected mass of women who are using it as a service. And so the Stellar Vumi partnership now allows those women to have mobile savings. So it's now banking for millions of people in South Africa who are currently unbanked. And it has a particular focus on savings accounts for women and for girls. So savings can be held in cash. They can also be held in airtime, which is almost interchangeable with cash. You can withdraw the airtime or the cash from your account. And for many, that's going to be the first savings account that they've ever had. So the transition from mobile money to mobile savings, which is where we are right now, that's the first necessary step in a disruptive transformation in capital markets. Savings have to be invested in order to reap returns. And of course, today, banks do that for individual account holders. They take the accounts, they aggregate them, they do fractional reserve lending. But there's another innovator that's starting to disrupt that very old model. There's a firm in the US called Lending Club. They made a billion dollars last year on an IPO. What they do is they aggregate individuals with small amounts of capital 
with individuals who need that capital. The model is really very simple. You can rock up with this little $25 to invest. You can then go through a set of applicants for the loans. You can figure out which loans you want to invest in that best fit your profile. If you're applying for a loan, you provide some basic information that's used to create a credit assessment. You get an interest rate assigned to you. And essentially, Lending Club creates a market between the folks who need capital and the folks who are providing it. The investor receives returns monthly as the loan is being paid off. And all of that happens online through a website. So Lending Club has created a connected peer-to-peer -peer market for capital raising, it's individuals making loans to other individuals. And that model would very easily fit on top of what Stellar and Vumi have announced in South Africa. Vumi is now already a connected marketplace of mobile savers, and so you could easily develop a loan investment product for all of those folks and bring those people in not just from saving, but into investing. Now that peer-to-peer -peer capitalization seems like it's very weak sauce when you think about the $40 billion a year that you need in East Africa to provide the kind of capital that you want to develop economies. And, okay, that would have been true until last month. But there's another fintech innovator. You might have heard of a company called Google. They just changed all of that. Because on the 15th of January, Google announced a tie-up with Lending Club. They're offering business loans of up to $600,000 to qualified applicants. So basically, a really rich investor has just walked into the lending pool. Now, just on the basics, this is a really good deal for Google because they have billions of dollars that they need to park somewhere. Might as well park it in something that's going to earn a good return. But the deal also has the added benefit that it allows Google to assist partnered businesses through loans rather than through direct investment. And so Google does actually invest in companies. They have an investment portfolio. But this lending club relationship allows Google to aid businesses that are part of Google's ecosystem but aren't good investment candidates. So Google gets to make an investment that accelerates its own growth, and the partner gets to grow, and Google gets the interest on the loan. So this is a true win-win. And that, that's exactly the kind of capital market that we're talking about here at this conference. The partnership between Lending Club and Google is another new type of capitalization in a connected economy. And it works equally well for an individual to an individual, or an SME, or a large business. And what I've been hearing over the last two days are all of these interesting emerging models. MCOPA taking the receipts book and turning that into a line of credit at a bank. Copa Copa with their connected customers providing a line of credit based on their history of transactions. So we now have multiple emerging models for capitalization for small businesses that all have this fundamental aspect that they're all connected. And as these models prove themselves, they're going to get replicated. Now, there are plenty of companies out there that aren't as large as Google, but they have aspirations to grow. And they're going to be building mechanisms like this to make business loans that will accelerate their own growth. And in the immediate future, say the next three to five years, those mechanisms are going to start to take root, not just in East Africa, but all around the world. And so we're going to see a range of services, all the way from microfinance through mortgages to bond issues, that are coming out of all of these new connected capitalization mechanisms. And that disruptive innovation is going to be spearheaded by a whole bunch of financial technology startups, fintech startups, that take these models, clone them, improve them, and bring them back out to the market. But of course, that's only the story so far. And that's actually less than half the story. Because the next few years are going to witness a technological disruption that is as potent and as fundamentally disruptive as the global adoption of mobiles. Because by the end of this decade, there will be five billion smartphones in the hands of four billion people. 
And so the, the, the mobile that we're familiar with, the feature phone that provided the foundation for mobile money and the mobile money economy, it's being replaced by a very powerful, very flexible, very well-connected, and very portable computers. And we need to start to think about that in the context of delivering skills to people, because someone with a smartphone can learn how to do an audit correctly, can learn how to account, can learn how to bookkeep. All of the skills that we see needing to put into SME businesses to help them get on a growth path, those are the kinds of skills that we will be able to deliver in a connected way when people are carrying smartphones around. So one of the things we need to think about is how we deliver a new level of education to businesses using the tools that they will have. Which means that all of these businesses using these tools are going to start to get a lot smarter, and finance and banking and money are about to get very smart indeed. Now, we have a precedent for what's about to happen. 50 years ago this month, IBM introduced the first modern computer, the System 360. It was a small little thing. Many of those first units immediately went into banks. And once they did the accounting ledger book, which had been used for 500 years before that, basically faded into obsolescence. The electronic ledger took its place, did the jobs hundreds and hundreds of times faster. And within a decade, all of but the most old-fashioned banks had digitized all of their operations. And at the same time made IBM well, in the 70s, IBM was the equivalent of Apple. It was one of the biggest companies in the world. And half a century ago, Systems 360, that was the financial disruption. That was the financial technology because it made complex financial transactions easy. So the world of credit that we have now with all the very fancy instruments, it couldn't exist without that. You couldn't have credit cards. You couldn't have payment systems. None of it. It all depends on that. Before this happened, before 1965, the world of banking and finance looked a lot more like 1915 than it did 2015. Okay, now in September, I purchased one of those. It's my shiny little iPhone 6. And after it arrived, I ran some calculations on it, and I realized that my, my little iPhone 6 had as much power as IBM's first year production run of the System 360. And the figures that were released last week say that Apple sold an iPhone to 1% of the planet in the last 10 weeks of 2014. They sold 72 million of them. And that thing, as powerful as it is in two years, it's going to be the bottom of the product range. There's going to be hundreds of millions of them out there. And they're going to be capable of running not just a single organization. Each of those is going to be able to run an entire financial network right there in your palm. And that simple fact is going to take everything that we know about how mobile money works and start turning it inside out. Because M-Pesa and every other mobile money system out there relies on a carrier and a bank to mediate exchanges of value. But you can start to think about different ways of doing it. You can use digital currencies. You could use Stellar. You could use Bitcoin. You can make your own digital currency. It's really easy these days. And you can allow individuals to exchange stores of value without an intermediary. You can do that nationally, you can do that internationally. Already we see Bitcoin becoming a de facto standard for remittances in the Philippines because it's much cheaper than other systems for doing it. Now what's interesting is that at around the time I got on the plane to come here on Monday, there was a news report came out about Ecuador. Ecuador on Monday announced that they were putting the entire country on a state-backed digital currency system. Now, Ecuador actually uses the U.S. dollar. They're dollarized. And so what they've done is they've created an entire digital currency infrastructure that's state-backed, dollar-backed, and will be deployed throughout the entire nation. They don't have mobile money in Ecuador right now, at least not in any big way. So they're about to leapfrog that now into a full deployed digital currency system. And they're probably not going to be the last nation to do that. And smartphones are ideal carriers for digital currencies because they support the cryptography that's required to make sure that no one's going to steal your money. All right, so where the mobile went, mobile money followed. Where the smartphone goes, 
digital currencies will follow. That won't be quite as true in East Africa because East Africa is already so well served with mobile money that digital currency is going to have to get very fancy and very good with its products and services before people will migrate. Now the market put the mobile, uh, pardon me, the mobile put the market in the hands of individuals. The smartphone allows individuals to create markets. The best example of this is a company called Uber. They're a disruptive technology startup. What they do is they connect a pool of available labor, that is drivers, with a pool of customers who need rides. And they basically do that with nothing more than a smartphone app that connects both sides. And just with a smartphone app, just with that bit of connectivity, they created a virtual global transportation network that currently has a $40 billion valuation. And they did that without any of the capitalization they would need if they were actually building a vehicle fleet. Uber is only the first and most noticeable example of what we're calling the appification of the economy. I want you to imagine that perhaps in a few years, Marico, the folks who did the coconuts, they could launch a smartphone app that connects directly to the coconut pickers. They could create a commodity trading platform for coconuts. And you could imagine the coconut pickers creating their own app so that they can create a coconut picking cartel, which would then deal with Marico. And all of these aggregations would happen through connectivity and through apps. And so what happens is as markets begin to amplify, this distinctions between commodities, securities, markets, all of this starts to blur. And I want you now to imagine that's what's going to happen to every other market everywhere. All the markets that exist today, all the markets that will exist tomorrow because all of the frictions about market formation have started to go away. There's a lovely quote. Mark Andreessen, who created the first popular web browser, said a few years ago that software is eating the world. I want to add a corollary to that. Connectivity is eating markets. And those markets don't stop with physical items like coconuts or services like transportation. Every market will be transformed, including capital markets. And so within a decade, the global banking system, the global capital markets are going to be shaped by 4 billion people with 5 billion smartphones. And each of those folks are going to be using a range of currencies. Some of those are going to be state-backed currencies. Some of those are going to be digital currencies. Markets will be developing their own custom currencies for trading within themselves. And that world is simultaneously very decentralized because banks will be increasingly disintermediated by smartphone apps. More of what a bank does will start to migrate into apps. It'll also be re-centralized because the connectivity allows the aggregation of markets and it creates rapid fleeting aggregations of labor and resources and capital. Okay, so how do we leapfrog the 20th century mechanisms for capital raising? Because that's the question that's really on everyone's lips here as we talk about how to bring capital markets into East Africa. Because just as M-Pesa leapfrog 20th century payment systems and thrust Kenya into an economy that no one predicted, there's now an opportunity to create platforms for capital that leverage the combination of connectivity and decentralization and aggregation to amplify the capacity of individuals and organizations to create and use capital markets. Lending Club and Google, what are they doing? They're already most of the way toward a new kind of a capital market. And we've been hearing about other examples here that are new kinds of capital markets. You need to study what they've done and you need to steal it. Because there's a great quote from Picasso, good artists copy, great artists steal. Now, a big organization will often find it difficult to fund or to be involved in an, in an activity that's going to disrupt their market. It's very easy to innovate around the edges, but transformative innovation, which is what the smartphone is really bringing to us, that's almost always going to come from an outsider, a small startup that has nothing to lose, because what the startup does 
is it disrupts a market in order to find a place in that market. Those startups are going to live fast, they're going to burn bright, most of them are going to crash out. The ones that survive, the ones that thrive, are going to be the ones that transform capital markets. So, can you identify those companies? Can you incubate those companies? Can you trust them to lead the way into the appification of the economy? Can you embrace a disruption of the way that you do business today? I want you to cast yourself back to those bankers in 1965. They had no idea what was about to hit them. We're in the same position, but at least we have their example to go by. We know that everywhere the smartphone goes, capital markets are going to be transformed. We might not know the precise shape of the future of capital, but we know that it's connected and decentralized and aggregated. And if we lean into those three trends, what will happen is that the billions who are already connected in these everywhere, always on markets, they are going to do much of the work for us. So those billions who are now connected with mobiles and are about to be connected with incredibly powerful smartphones and incredibly capable apps, they're the engine that will drive these new capital markets. If you harness their intelligence and their capacity, the capital will follow. Thank you. Do we want, does anyone have any questions? Covered a lot of ground there. Stacy? <laughs> I, I can, um, how much, uh, all right. How, you all know what Bitcoin is, yes? You've all heard of it. Do you all know what the blockchain is, which is the technology that underlies Bitcoin? It's essentially, um, a cryptographically secure mechanism. It's something that prevents forgery and it's something that can be authenticated. So it's similar to a signature and it's now being used to create contracts that are being witnessed by an entire network. So you could, I could have a contract with someone and produce that contract, say with Stacy. Stacy and I would, would sign the contract and the contract would be witnessed by the entire network. So it's a way of conducting contracts that has not much of the normal legal frictions associated with it. That will be a preferred mechanism in places where the rule of law is not necessarily considered a great thing because it provides an alternative mechanism. Where there is strong rule of law, there's not gonna be as much need, all right? But what we're going to see and what we're already seeing is the emergence of a mechanism for contracts that doesn't require strong rule of law within a specific locality. 